Support for Lab Out Loud is provided by NSTA, the National Science Teaching Association. Find out more about what NSTA has to offer at nsta.org. You're listening to Lab Out Loud, Science for the Classroom and Beyond. And today our guest is Dr. Lauren Robinson. She takes us to many different places to study animal welfare. As an animal welfare scientist, I go into lots of facilities. I will go to research facilities wearing full personal protective equipment. I actually can get up close to animals or even in contact with them. Uh, if you are employed at a zoo, then you may be able to go out for an hour a day, you know, uh, five times a week or even less, depending on the project. So there's a lot of variation in regards to how long you spend observing. That's up next on Lab Out Loud, but first, I'm your co-host, Dale Basler. And I'm Brian Bartell. And Brian, we have been doing the Scientists Out Loud. Scientists Out Loud, yes. Scientists Out Loud. What are we calling this? Like It's a, a series. series. Yeah. It's like, like a, a series. Yeah. A collection of episodes in which we call up researchers. Um, ultimately, the idea by one Brian Bartell to do this. And it has been so um, enlightening. I, I, it's been really a lot of fun. But there are definitely some themes, I think, that are emerging. And today's interview really touches on one of the themes. And that is that there is not a linear path or a direct path to becoming a scientist. Well, that's a fascinating aspect to remember that you don't have to be, um, you know, in the in in those sciences to do science. Well, I think this is, the, you know, it's certainly not limited to science, but this happens for you know educators and students because you still, you know, as someone who's uh, helping my kids pick up classes, and you're in this boat now too with uh, uh, middle schoolers. You oh, look yeah. at the the book. The book is actually online now, but you know, you look at the courses, and some courses have a flow chart. You take this, then this, then this, and then this, and then later in college, if you do this and this and this, and surprise, you're at the end of the board, the game board, and you become <laughs> a scientist. And um, that's not how it works. It's, it's not at all for it, not for everyone. Some people it does. But you do not have to follow. You can flip the board over and make your own game pieces. Jump to a different and, board. <laughs> yeah, you can jump back around to a little start, bit. And I mean, there's been a lot of different paths that I think actually has been one of the more fascinating things learning about this um, through the through the researchers we've had on the show. So then it's really key to think about what are the core things that we want our students to develop. And it's maybe less that focus on college ready, career ready. Um, Oh, maybe not less, but let's not forget that that's not the only thing. We need those other qualities of curiosity and passion for learning and passion for making a change in the world and and things like that to drive them, you know, to move around through these things. I mean, it's it's a lot to swallow there. And I'm thinking as my as you mentioned, I have middle schoolers like, oh, my gosh, if we don't get them on this path, they're going to never going to get to the end point. Um, But you're right. it, It. Almost like teaching them the flexibility to be able to maneuver through these different paths is probably, how do you teach that? Mm -hmm. Well, our guest, as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Lauren Robinson joins us. So my name is Dr. Lauren Robinson. I am a postdoc at the University of Veterinary Medicine in Vienna, Austria. And I'm actually here studying cooperation and partner roles in canids. Uh, and in this case, dogs and wolves, uh, and they're actually Canadian North American wolves. So uh, very exciting kind of research. And as we talk with her, we kind of go through all those twists and turns of becoming a researcher. So you had to go to the Vienna to study Canadian and North American wolves. How does how does that happen? Yeah, that always trips people up a bit. Um, so my boss, uh, Professor Friederica Ronge, uh, started this about a decade ago or more now um, with a couple of her collaborators. Um, and they started the Wolf Science Center. And they started with North American gray wolves just because they are a little bit easier to work with. And so at the Wolf Science Center, we actually group house, um, you know, domestic dogs and these North American gray wolves. Uh, and they actually live in groups with their conspecifics, which is a term meaning animals of the same species. So the wolves live with other wolves. The dogs live with other dogs in groups. And it allows us to actually compare how they do on cognitive tasks 
and different tests that we give them to see if, you know, when they live in the same way, if they actually get similar or very different results on these tasks. And then we also work with pet dogs in Vienna as another comparison. But basically, we're trying to tease apart domestication uh, while considering and controlling for that effect of living with people or not. So that's why we have the group house dogs. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, those North American ones are apparently easier, uh, a little less shy than the European wolves. Well, we try our best. <laughs> <laughs> well, considering that we, we probably have quite a few North American listeners right now, mm-hmm. what should we know about um, North American wolves? Uh, well, you know, the big thing that we've taken from our lab is that they are a lot more social and tolerant than people think, you know. All of us are really, you know, used to working with our dogs. Many of us grow up with them, right? Uh, They're a big part of at least, you know, my childhood uh, in the Pacific Northwest, you know, hunting dogs and, you know, waterfowl dogs and all that, along with pet dogs. Um, Mm -hmm. And we think about dogs as being really friendly with us. Uh, But it turns out that they're not as great with other dogs. So the wolves are much more tolerant. They tend to more equally share food. Uh, They tend to be better at working together to solve tasks. And so that's a big thing that I have found surprising. I actually came to this job from a primatology background. uh, And so I had no idea before I read all these articles that wolves actually are very social with each other. We might call those 21st century skills nowadays in our schools, right? You know, like they have, they have better, they better have, they have better collaboration skills. They have better communication skills, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, (laughs) it was really surprising and I've now read a significant amount of the research and seen them. uh, And it's true, you know, obviously dogs are much more focused on us, but until we did this kind of research uh, with the group house dogs and the group house wolves, we didn't know that. Wow. There's yeah. a, I have a black lab and she does not yeah. tolerate other dogs well. And, uh, yeah. she barely, she barely tolerates the cats and, yeah. uh, they, you know, that it's just kind of funny to watch that way. But you're saying that's different with wolves. Is that a, a domestication issue or is that something that we see at just n- natural in the wild? Uh, well, with wolves, it is something in the wild, yeah, that they are just more tolerant of each other. Uh, so we aren't currently studying wide, wild wolves. Um, so, you know, obviously there's the fact that they are raised with us and so on. But yes, it seems to be something about domestication where the dogs just lose that tolerance of one another to the same degree that the wolves have it you know they seem to redirect it to us or something and i think it's pretty common to hear about behavioral problems where you know dogs don't like other dogs and so on um but i don't know if as many people realize that wolves are really good with other wolves at least pack mates you know the individuals they live with we don't test them with uh wolves that they don't live with I was going to ask, how how does the research lead to like changes in, I guess, we humans? (laughs) What does it change for our behaviors? Are we learning anything about wolves that are going to make us um, do things differently? You know, I don't know if there's as much of the applied aspect to it with this research. Um, You know, a lot of it is just kind of trying to understand those species differences. Um, And so we don't do as much of that kind of work directly ourselves, Um, teasing apart domestication and understanding Mm -hmm. how it's changed animals is useful in itself. I think Um, the fact that, you know, we can think about dogs as less tolerant and less cooperative one with one another is interesting, potentially, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but obviously dogs play a very different role in our lives uh, than wolves do out in the wild. Um, so I don't know if there's as much of the applied aspect yet. I think there's the potential down the line once we learn more. Well, Dale and I live in northern the United the northern United States, and we definitely are seeing a, an increased population of wolves and coyotes mm-hmm. and other things like that. So, is there something that that research tells us or informs us about what we might be seeing in in literally in our backyards? You know, I don't want to go beyond my own expertise. And so not being an ecologist by trade, um, I don't know is the honest answer. Um, You know, I think it helps us understand them out in the wild in general to think about these family units that 
work together and you know why they live like that and what enables it is this tolerance and this cooperation um, but as far as what we're seeing in our backyards not you know as much the applied side i guess we sure. can just be more disappointed in our own domesticated dogs. Like, why can't you be more like the wolf and get together, <laughs> get along with the others? <laughs> I think that um, the wolves have shown to be pretty good with people as well. But, you know, we can't be disappointed in the dogs that we domesticated for ourselves, right? Yeah, uh, Brian, they learned it from watching you. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and the fact that they work so well with us, the different roles that they do play, it's very interesting. Dogs are unique in that regard, right? I mean, I can't get my cat to do anything. Uh, with dogs, they play a really important role for us as far as, you know, guide dogs and things like that. Um, and so I would never be disappointed with what we've gotten other than obviously selecting for better health and so on. So there's welfare implications for some of our domestication and particularly our, our breeding practices with dogs that we could definitely improve. Uh, but as far as what they do for us, you know, as a whole, really unique and wonderful. Sure. Now, how often on a regular basis are you actually, you know, in the presence of actual wolves? Uh, well, right now I've been on holiday. Um, mm-hmm. In general, I, I know, guess, but scientists take holidays. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but in general, you know, it really depends. I think a lot of times, you know, people hear animal science and they assume we're out there all the time. But yeah. if I'm not collecting data, I might go out and see the wolves a couple times a week. But then if I'm going to start a project, it could be, you know, four or five times a week. It really depends on what stage of the process we're at. Um, we're very lucky okay. to have these wolves available to us to work with, you know, and we have wonderful trainers who schedule, you know, all that Um and we find time to work with them as well and the wolves. So it really depends is the answer. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of variation. I have a lot of students in the past that have, you know, it's like, oh, you know, they're juniors and seniors. And mm-hmm. what did you want to do for college? I actually have my own son who uh, is not going to college, but we don't know what it is yet for. Sure. But, um, you know, the, one of the things that comes up is um, they want to be a veterinarian. Sure. And I grew up on a dairy farm. So I'm like, ooh, veterinarian. <laughs> you know, there's a lot to that. You yeah. Know? It's not might not be what you think. And, you know, often I'll ask like, uh, well, why do you why? why how do you how do you choose that? Oh, um, yeah. I like animals. And I'm like, yeah. OK. And um, yeah. do you have any advice for students out there that are th- like, like looking at like, an, you know, animal research, veterinary yeah. and those kinds of things? I assume it's more than just liking animals. What else um, <laughs> do they have to be aware of? Well, I think the the major thing to be aware of is that you do not have to go down the veterinary route. Uh, You do not have to go down the, you know, even biology route, though, of course, that is an option. Uh, I myself am a psychologist. So my undergrad is from the University of Washington, uh, and it is in psychology. And my PhD is from the University of Edinburgh, also in psychology. And so, yeah, so you can actually get into the animal research in a variety of different ways. Uh, You do not have to be into the physical sciences. I myself am not uh, really, you know, trained in biology as much as the behavioral sciences. And so, you know, one of the things I do really like about the U.S. undergraduate system is those two years of general education Uh, because they're great opportunities to do things like take electives in psychology or anthropology is another area where you can, you know, get into the animal research. And so a lot of the advice that I tend to give is be open-minded to different ways of doing this. You know, veterinary school is very difficult to get into. It's harder than medical school. And I agree that, you know, um, there's a lot going on. I have a great deal of respect for veterinarians on all they do. Um, for me, I, I never really considered that route. I did consider, uh, pre-med before I discovered I'm horrible at chemistry. (laughs) But luckily, being a behaviorist, I don't have to go that route, you know. But math is still incredibly important. 
you know, Mm -hmm. even if you're from the social sciences background, you know, I'm always doing some kind of statistics. I'm taking coursework in that. And so while I don't have to do algebra by hand anymore, you know, it's of course useful to take mathematics courses, you know, when they tell you or when you ask yourself, what am I going to do with algebra? Well, it turns out a lot. Um, So if science is at all in your realm nowadays, a math kind of background and grounding is incredibly important. Do you meet scientists who do struggle with math? Like they get assistance from other scientists or how how, how do they work through that? Because I've certainly met my share of students who have a passion for science. I think I was one of those students myself um, where I I loved learning science, but I was definitely slower and struggled with math. Are you doomed? (laughs) (laughs) No, I hope not, you know, um, because I certainly have taken a fair amount of statistics classes. And the nice thing about statistics is, you know, of course, it really helps, like I said, to have that grounding. But also you can collaborate with others that are stronger in that realm. You know, that is the beauty of modern science is Uh knowing where you struggle and where you are anxious. Um, You work with people who are stronger in that realm. But also, you know, there's a functional approach to statistics that many people take as well if they're not as strong in math, Um, where it's about understanding what does that statistic do and how do I interpret the results? Uh, And then again, working with someone who will help you um, if they're stronger in statistics. And then your Mm -hmm. reviewers of your papers will tell you if you have messed up as well. (laughs) Sure. <laughs> Check so your work, I right? think people are regularly, you know, turned off by that or intimidated by it. Uh, but it's certainly not the end of the world. That can definitely be countered. Okay. Well, then, are you you're taking a course right now? Are you doing that in Vienna? I would uh, so imagine. I'm going to take a course uh, in next month, uh, and yes, it's a two week. Uh, statistics class on something called linear modeling, which is kind of like everything right now (laughs) in social science. Uh, And yeah, it's one of the perks of being an academic is that, you know, which I know it sounds strange to high schoolers if they're kind of burned out on school or something, but it's a perk that you get free classes. Uh, and why would I want to take more classes? Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, the truth is in science, I'm getting free classes right now, dad. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No. And now, you know, once you're, you know, a postdoc, you're like, yeah, I've got time for classes because the professors are going, Oh, I wish I had time to learn more statistics, you know? So it's funny how it turns around. So then do you know the language there? So I do not speak German. You know, it's a tough thing uh, in science. Obviously, we move a lot early career. So deciding how much of a language you're going to learn. You know, one of the things I wish the U.S. school system was better about was, you know, that foreign language early on because we do really start um, behind. You know, I work with people that speak three, four, five languages, and it's just amazing. Uh, but the thing is, unless you're taking like undergraduate courses, um, things that are offered for researchers tend to be in English because, you know, it is the primary language of science. All of our publications are written in it. My entire lab works in English. Not all of us. I don't speak German. Uh, multiple others don't. You know, I would say maybe at most half our lab are, you know, Austrian or German. So we come from quite a few different uh, backgrounds. Okay. Mm -hmm. Was that intimidating when you decided to um, go to to Vienna as part of your career? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, again, it's a real privilege. And I realize that even more so now to be an English speaker, because to be an immigrant and not speak the language and still be able to get around um, is something that I'm really lucky uh, to have. As English speakers, we have that. And I recognize more, you know, that in other countries, if you come in with a different language than English, this just would not be the case. So it was certainly intimidating. And I think, you know, sometimes it's something that gets in the way of Mm, fully engaging in the culture. But at the same time, I don't struggle to find English speakers even outside of, you know, my academic lab or my university. So it's been eye-opening in the sense of how very big a privilege it is to be an English speaker natively. 
So you mentioned that you did your graduate work. Uh, tell us about that process from, I guess, uh, what took you from the Pacific Northwest? Wow. Um, so my mother is English. Uh, and so I have dual citizenship with the UK and the US. And when I was finishing up at the University of Washington, I was looking for master's programs. And someone suggested uh, this program in Edinburgh uh, called uh, Masters of Science in Applied Animal Behavior and Animal Welfare. And I applied, I got in, uh, I had a really great time. It was the first time I'd worked with monkeys. Uh, they assigned me to work with some at the Highland Wildlife Park, um, which was just wonderful. It's a bit further north in Scotland, beautiful mm-hmm. region, the Highlands. Uh, and then from there, I applied and got into the psychology department to study animal personality and welfare in primates. And so for me, you know, it's a unique situation. Again, another privilege that I have this dual citizenship and this background with uh, both cultures that it wasn't such a leap for me um, Mm -hmm. to jump to the UK, having been raised by an English mother. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering about that because if you, your arc starts with psychology as a, as an undergrad. And were your parents going like, wait, wait, what, what? Yes, <laughs> um, they were. <laughs> but yeah, I was wondering how I, that would work. Like, I thought you just finished psychology and then you kind of switched to animal behavior. But well, as you explain it now, it makes total sense. Yeah, doesn't it? I mean, I'm yeah, it does. now looking back, the story makes a lot more sense. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my parents both work for Washington State. And so... Um, mm-hmm. I was in high school by the time my dad got an undergraduate. I think I was already in community college, in fact. Uh, And so this whole world is rather novel to us Um, anyway, you know. And so explaining graduate school, even how it works, as I was trying to understand how it works, was quite an experience. And then you move to the UK, which has a different system in a lot of ways you know american phds take you know five to seven years british ones they get you out the door in a maximum of four you know um and so yeah (laughs) in that regard that was probably where most of the learning was i understood Mm -hmm. the british culture fine uh but the academic culture has been a real you know crash course in itself so sure. we've had a couple people talk about their experiences with graduate school and their their path and their postdoc and whatnot. It, it, how is it different in the UK? Well, besides you know, the besides the time frame. Yeah. Um, well, the time frame is going to be one of the bigger ones, but also you know because a lot of people in the UK when they start their PhD they already have a master's. Uh, there's not a coursework requirement in a lot of the programs, or at least there wasn't in mine. And so you're immediately thrown into designing and starting your research, you know, and depending on what you want to do, you know, the reality is the UK system is shorter. Therefore, you're going to compete against um, American PhD graduates that have longer to publish and write up. And I don't know your experience with publishing, but mine has been that it takes a while. Um, And so in that regard, the UK system is really great for someone who has an idea of what they want to do right away and they're focused on it. You know, I was collecting data within the first six months of my PhD. Oh, wow. Yeah, we've talked to some people who have talked about how they've even changed paths within their graduate work Mm -hmm. and how that uh, it's kind of been a circuitous, uh, again, endeavor as they learn, oh, this is what I want to do. And then I learn something else and I but it sounds like that's a little bit more crash course there and you're expected to kind of sink or swim right from the get-go well and I I think that they make every effort you know that you don't sink um but yeah it's a very different mentality and the focus and the timing and so on I'm not sure I certainly didn't do the project that I applied to do the PhD with um but that's not to say like right away again designing getting approval i was doing research actually i was back in the states to do that first bit of research um and so it is very much on the run in a way you know but also it's the standard phd program thing where you're still trying to figure out what you're doing what you're supposed to be doing you know, so it's hard for me to compare having not really even been in a department um, since getting my PhD um, in the U.S., you know. Sure. 
You had mentioned that you did some of your postdoc work back in the United States in at Disney. I don't. I, I think didn't. we have to yep. talk about that, right? <laughs> yeah, I did a postdoc in animal behavior and endocrinology at Disney's uh, Animal Kingdom. So I was a contracted employee. I worked for a local university with it, and then I worked within Disney for that contract. What did you learn um, there, or or did you were you able to? I guess um, I, I guess many many of our students probably don't even think that that's an option to be a scientist at Disney. Yeah, it's a very unique experience. Um, you know, I don't think you can really replicate it um, is the truth. So when you're doing work in zoos, you know, I have been a student that worked in zoos and researched for my university. Um, and I've not been an employee outside of, you know, that Disney zoo Um so I don't know how it works in a non-corporate zoo, uh, but mm-hmm. Disney is very much about the application. And so my day was typically about designing projects around the park, trying to assess animal welfare, writing up reports within that, uh, along with trying to learn endocrinology, which I was not great at, <laughs> not coming from a physical sciences background. Uh, that was an area I struggled, but that also happens. You know, um, we often think about, oh my gosh, what if I'm not good at one part of my career, you know, and it still, I think like you talked about earlier, learning what you want to do and so on. Um, I definitely learned that the social science part was uh, where I was interested in the behavior, that side of things from that experience. Uh, But it was also amazing because I got to publicly engage uh, with kids all the time. Oh, okay. Uh, So that was really cool. It was part of my job description to go out and engage with the public and people coming through the park, you know, and teach them about science. And that was so unique because when are you ever going to get that audience again? You know, I know they had the like the little Rafiki train. We're yeah. going there in a in a month. Yep. We're actually going to stay at the Animal yeah. Kingdom hotel thing. Yeah. And so I'm like, oh, please don't tell me anything bad. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, yeah. So that's actually where I would, you know, uh, work and, uh, yeah. you can check in on their science. You can look into their lab. So it's very interesting in that regard. Um, yeah, and, they were doing like a surgery on a turtle who ate something. Yeah, and, like, amazing. People isn't were, it? Mm, yeah, it was just captivating. It was, it was crazy. Yeah, now that veterinary window is really a great way to teach the public as well, getting mm-hmm. to see things. Yeah, well, oh, mm. such a cool setup. It's interesting because I was looking on like Google Maps because mm. I was trying to figure out like where we're staying and ultimately like where's the grocery store. And I started looking at like the satellite view, and I'm like, wow, this is like. It is, I mean, it is definitely a zoo. They make it sound like it's like just some, you know, like uh, anomaly in, in uh, yeah. you know, like, oh, surprise, <laughs> there's animals here. They're amazing. But, that zoo yeah, is you, huge. Uh, and they are an accredited zoo. Uh, so I think that that does happen a lot where people are like, how did you work for Disney? How does this work? And, you know, yeah. oh, that is a zoo. You know, yeah. um, I myself um, really wanted to work in a zoo and so that was my interest in that Mm -hmm. how about the the things you you did some work earlier Mm -hmm. um you said in primates what what about that i feel like we talked a little bit about wolves but what have you learned about primates in particular what primates did you work with um so i actually have worked with more primates than anything else i do consider myself still a primatologist along with the fact that i do so many other things Uh, in fact i'm editing a book on primate welfare uh so the primates that i have directly worked with uh include japanese macaques and rhesus macaques but then i've also done studies with capuchins uh and chimpanzees Uh, So quite a few different primates. And in fact, my entire PhD was about primate personality and welfare and understanding how the differences in, you know, who they are, their personality, you know, are related to how they feel. So animal welfare, of course, is just a critically important topic. Um, And so right now I'm studying cognition, but that background in personality and welfare is something I'm still really passionate about. And being an early career researcher, something I want to eventually combine with cognition uh, to understand the individual, regardless of if it's a primate or a canid or, you know, I I even did some work with goats. 
So mm-hmm. I, <laughs> I work with all sorts of species. Mm-hmm. Oh, goats. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Disney had some goats. And at first I was like, oh, God. And then I was really fond of them <laughs> by the end. You spend enough time with any species and suddenly you're like, goats are just the cutest. <laughs> yeah. these aren't the these aren't the, like the petting zoo goats you're talking about probably either no they were they were oh they were oh, they, were. Yeah, they yeah. were but i think they were i think nubian goats uh so they're an african uh breed of goat and so they were pretty large um so there were the petting zoo goats as well but yeah oh, wow. um they were they're just so goats. sassy they are. They have really great personality. Like as yeah, a personality they... researcher, you know, I was like, oh, it's not a monkey. It's not going to yell at me. And then within a day, I'm like, what are you doing? You're getting into trouble. You're amazing. I just love you. One of the yeah. things that I'm one of the things I'm, that's going through my mind is talking about the different species you've worked with. And yeah. I'm, I'm sure our listeners are thinking, how close <laughs> do you get to these animals um i mean a goat you probably can get pretty darn close especially if they're petting zoo goats but um i've also seen pictures in your media that you're kind of like in a like a high hide kind of a situation you're behind screens so tell us a little bit about that well it really depends you know one of the big things that's important to consider is um primates are not pets uh exotic animals make horrible pets And so, yes, there are cases where I am working directly with animals. You know, I, as an animal welfare scientist, I go into lots of facilities. And that does mean that I will go to research facilities uh, where, you know, wearing full personal protective equipment, I actually can get up close to animals or even in contact with them. Uh, You know, it's a really important part of my own philosophy uh, that when I'm doing welfare work, You know, I go in and I look at everything and I don't turn away from it because I'm there to ideally understand and reduce suffering. Uh, And so it's important. I really look at animals. So there are cases where I have gotten up close. I have taken opportunities to learn. I go to necropsies, Um, you know, not necessarily because there's something you know, that I just feel really passionate about doing myself, but because I think it's important to see the entire part of the process for animals. So there are cases where I do get up really close with the wolves. We may work in direct contact with them with, again, these expert trainers that know the animals. uh, And so we take every safety precaution required, but some of our studies do require working directly with them. So it really depends, you know, but I try not to share too many photos of that because it sends the wrong message. There's studies about, you know, seeing photos of people in direct contact with these species suggest that it's safe uh, for everyone to do. And it's not, you know, I've been romanticizing that. Yeah, exactly. I've been studying animal behavior for more than a decade. I've worked, you know, in half a dozen facilities, if not more, Um, you know, and so it's really I respect animals. I think it's also one of the dangers of this field that people come in like, oh, my gosh, animals, cute, fluffy. Um, But I never lose track of the fact that, um, you know, a macaque is a really strong species, even though it's, you know, only medium size uh, and capable of doing a lot of damage. I respect every animal I work with, and I take that into consideration when I do work directly with them. Uh, And it's not something the public should be doing, of course. Um, So it's a fine line. It's kind of one of those tricky areas. Yes definitely get in contact with some species, which is a privilege of uh, the experience and respecting animals and building a reputation for that. Okay. Hmm. When you're observing the animals, how long of a, like, what's that like? You know, (laughs) field notes, a notepad, um, just hours and hours. How, you know, what's a day like that? (laughs) <laughs> Definitely hours and hours. It really depends. You know, um, when you have you're to work PhD- on their time scale. Kind of, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, when you're a PhD student, if you're going out to collect data, you know, um, say in a different area that you don't usually live, then you are going to spend all day, every day for potentially months, um, observing animals. Uh, if you are employed at a zoo, then you may be able to go out for an hour a day, you know, 
uh, five times a week or even less, depending on the project. So there's a lot of variation in regards to how long you spend uh, observing. But yes, they it's definitely on their schedule. If an animal does not want to be observed, they are very good at getting into areas that you cannot see. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have to move to the next observation. As far as how... Uh, there's actually quite a few different programs out there nowadays. Uh, so you can do it in pen and paper if that's all the project calls for and that's the only kind of data you need. Uh, but otherwise, nowadays, there's applications on, you know, mobile devices. Uh, there's an animal sure. behavior program that I think is $2. It's called Animal Behavior Pro. Uh, there's, you know, something called Observer, which is significantly more than $2. Uh, <laughs> So you have like your whole ecosystem of apps just for your field. Yeah. Yeah, it really depends, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, and the zoos, the zoos have a program that they have invested in as well. So it depends. There's a really great book um, on observing animal behavior. Sorry, I'm trying to see if I've got it. Here we go. Um, So measuring behavior, an introductory guide by Paul Martin and Patrick Bateson is like the classic book in our field it's something like i don't know 30 40 dollars um and it reviews all of this information which is fantastic Hmm. yeah what about like do you design experiments when you know is it only just straight up natural observation or do you design experiments for example if like if you're saying like the wolves cooperate do you like put them in scenarios to see if they'll cooperate Yeah, so actually I'm here um, funded under an Austrian Science Foundation grant, uh, and that is exactly what we're doing. We're using what are called economic gains uh, to test if they cooperate and if they understand the role of their partner. So we are directly manipulating things. Uh, For example, the main game that we'll be using is called the assurance game, Uh, and it's a game that's been tested with people and, you know, different primates and so on. And basically, um, you get the choice between stag and hare, and you choose and your partner chooses. If you choose hare, you always get a reward. If you both choose stag, you get a better reward, right? So there's this benefit to cooperating. You have to kind of figure out and reach that. Uh, But if somebody picks stag and the other person picks hare, then the person that picked hare gets a reward. Person that picks stag gets nothing. And so we're actually doing this with the dogs. I have a fantastic PhD student, Maida, who is doing these studies with dogs, and I'm going to start them eventually uh, and hopefully soon with the wolves at the Wolf Science Center and basically, you know, giving them these options and seeing if they understand the need to both pick stag, it gets them the best reward. And then you do things like you, you know, put something between the animals so they can't see what the other is choosing, you know, because if oh, they, wow. are... these are, these are tests I've heard of, you know, done with people. <laughs> yeah. Well, it has yeah. been done with people. Um, uh-huh. it's really cool like that, you know, and we do things like we manipulate if they can see and hear each other, you know, primarily see in this case, uh, mm-hmm. because if they can see each other's choices and they understand the game and the role that the other animal plays, they should be better at picking stag than when they can't. So hmm. we do a lot of different manipulations in this case, uh, you know, mm-hmm. for the studies. And the trick is, you know, of course, I can't explain the rules to the dogs like we can. You at least start off with four too. cards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but actually one of my favorite studies. So um, my other boss is actually at Georgia State, Sarah, uh, Professor Sarah Brosnan. And she did a study where they didn't give people instructions. You know, they, they kind of treated it like the the primate version you know they just kind of said okay hand back a token you know that represented stag or hair and people really struggled like when you took the instructions out people were not as good at it at all and they didn't even think to necessarily communicate with each other really Hmm. so weird so then the dogs had a leg up on us Uh. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so we haven't done the dog studies yet we'll find out uh, but yeah it's interesting and it's obviously a challenge and trying to do these methods that are very similar because if you give people instructions of course they get it better you know all right sure yeah and then so, you wonder if they're yeah you know, i suppose 
a true study of are you really doing it for self-interest or right. just because the rules were said now this is how you do it right right you know um there's lots of studies as far as you know when you offer someone else an unfair reward how do they respond and so on right uh with the mm -hmm. docs we're keeping it pretty simple we're not getting too far into it it's just do you understand the game and do you understand the role of the partner in it mm -hmm. all right well lauren thank you so much for your time before we let you go is there anything you'd like to tell our listeners uh, we, we anticipate there's obviously science educators in the midst there are probably students in the midst uh, what do you want to leave us with? Well, you know, I think my main thing, again, thinking about high schoolers in particular, those that aren't sure where they're going, um, is, again, just be open to different backgrounds, different electives, try different things. Um, you know, of course, with animals being the focus of my research, it's really easy to think it's all about the passion for just getting to work with animals, which is a huge part of it. But, you know, we're just also so incredibly passionate about research design and statistics and answering questions, you know, that I think that's really what makes for someone who's going to do well and, you know, pursue animal behavior is in addition to that passion for animals, that passion for the research. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time, and thank you yeah. for joining us and sharing with us what you do and how you got there. All right. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Lab Out Loud. If you'd like to learn more about some of the things discussed in this episode or previous episodes, you can find show notes at our website, laboutloud.com. If you have a guest idea or a future topic that you'd like to see on Lab Out Loud, go to our contact page and send us a message. Also, you can subscribe to Lab Out Loud on your favorite podcasting app, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you like to find podcasts. While you're there, leave us a review and rating. Your input helps others find our show. Thanks again for listening.